Hello, hope you're doing well, and welcome to Sketchbook Session, the informal format in which I invite you all to get comfy and come join me for a bit of drawing-filled downtime while I kind of just ramble about whatever's on my mind. And what's on my mind today, as it has been for the past couple weeks, is the recent Beyond Into... A, whichever one the title of this most recent one is, the sequel, the, the new Spider-Man movie that came out. Um, <laughs> There are a couple of different trains of thought that have really stuck with me in the wake of watching it, but before I get into the thick of it all, I do want to say that even though I do typically try to keep any fandom specific videos like this as spoiler free as possible, and even though I am reasonably sure that pretty much everybody has already seen Across the Spider-Verse by now, uh, if you have not seen it yet, please proceed into this video with caution because I'm kind of just going off the dome here so I can't guarantee that this is going to be completely spoiler free. But yeah, you have been warned, so let's go, we're going, we move. Um, <laughs> so going into this page of doodles, um, I initially planned to just do like a handful of rough sketches of Gwen specifically, because I knew I wanted to do a kind of separate individual piece for her based on some of the thoughts that I do want to talk about in a little bit. But given the fact that I just loved every single character in this movie, the canvas kind of ended up spiraling into more of a full-on multi-character experimental sketch dump, which is to say that I ended up just drawing a bunch of the main cast kind of all over the place at random, some more than others because there's no real rhyme or reason here, and trying my hand at least a little bit at rendering each of them in an art style that would look at least similar to how they appeared in the movie. And yeah, it was just a really fun experiment, I would definitely recommend trying it out if you want to kind of have a go at drawing all the different spider people like this, or even just emulating all the different styles that they might have. While I'm on the topic of how everybody appeared in the movie though, I gotta go off about a couple of like bits and pieces for a second. First of all, the creativity, the integration of so many different art styles, some of which weren't even necessarily art styles. Um, again, kind of trying not to spoil the things, but if you've seen the movie, you're gonna know which little moments that I'm talking about there, and you know what it looks like, and you know that it looks really good. Not to mention from more of a story writing fanboy perspective, which is the perspective that I tend to just go about life with. Um, <laughs> With the pure amount of stuff that was packed in, it felt like getting to see multiple movies all in one go, and I mean that in a very good way. I was just absolutely beside myself getting to pick up on all the tiny easter eggs and plot threads and feel the pieces all clicking together as the movie went on because they were all interwoven in just such a satisfying and like rewarding kind of way. And um, actually, while I'm on the topic of things like interweaving and, you know, webs and whatnot, I do also want to take another second to just appreciate these characters because they were just all of them so engaging and fun and really easy to get familiar with, even in a movie with such a non-stop pace and a huge cast. Kicking it off, of course, with Spider-Punk, Hobie Obi Brown. He is so cool, and his art style was also way easier to mimic than I thought it might be. I kind of just went all over the place with the lasso film and it was really fun to see come together. Then you got Spider-Man Mumbai, or Mumbatan even. Certified Sunshine Boy, he also moves around in such a cool way, and Another Easy Day for Spider-Man was one of my favourite lines in the entire movie. He is so funny, his personality is delightful, and I just love him. Then of course we got Miles, who's the star of the show, we already knew about him, but it was so cool to see how much cooler he'd gotten since the first movie, while also getting to see how much more cringe he'd gotten as well in certain situations. And I did genuinely love of that like layer of awkwardness for him because it adds so much humanity to the superhuman storyline and I was gonna say universe but the many superhuman universes that he's navigating. Then you got Peter, proud dad, prouder mentor Parker and Miguel, fake dad, bad boss O'Hara who we can all agree, two very different ends of the let's call it the father figure spectrum, right? Love them. Uh, <laughs> Love the juxtaposition, love the very different kinds of like both desperation and leadership that they both got to show in their own different ways. I just really love a juxtaposition of ideals like that. And uh, again, I'm trying to stay at least a bit spoiler free here in terms of that whole parallels kind of topic, but if you know, you know, this movie really delivered on that front in so many ways. Um, <laughs> And that's not even to mention Jessica Drew and Scarlet Spider and all of the other brilliantly crafted characters that appeared. Not least of all, The Spot, who was rocking that mob psycho kind of visual aesthetic by the second half, which genuinely had my jaw on the floor that was so cool to see in like an American animated movie like this. 
I also remember being blown away really early on actually by the design of the Vulture, which I didn't know that that was going to be a character in the movie, but it was so cool seeing how he had like that parchment look with the Da Vinci style equations and formulas popping up all around him. Like I was just sitting in the cinema thinking if we get something that looks this cool this early on in the movie, then oh my god, this is going to slap. And then for the next three hours or so, the movie did indeed proceed to slap. Um, <laughs> And I mean, hell, those are just one or two examples out of so many because art style wise, I was just dumbfounded every five minutes with this movie. Like between the individual styles of the spider people themselves and then the worlds that they came from, there was just a constant stream of truly innovative, like creative energy jumping out of the screen. And you know, as a creative myself, it was really refreshing. And, and given the, you know, pretty disheartening AI stuff and everything else that's been on the rise lately, really reassuring to see. It was just like, really moving, I think, to get to see such a, like, I don't even know how to word it, but it, it just felt like watching a collection of pure human creativity that was just so full of like life and life experience. And you could really see that all of, yeah, just all of those kind of really human experiences had gone into the craftsmanship. I feel like I'm waxing poetic about it now, but it, it was just really special to get to see that. One other element of the movie that really, really resonated with me though, um, and as the thumbnail of this video has probably already given away, is kind of the crux of what I wanted to sit down and ruminate on here for a bit, were the parts of the film that happened in Gwen's universe in particular, because there were a couple of understated things in those scenes that really hit me in the heart to an unexpected degree. I have no doubt that a lot of y'all who've stopped by to watch this video will have um, either in the lead up or the follow up to seeing this movie yourselves. Um, it's pretty likely that you will have seen other folks online talking about the idea of Gwen being trans. It was kind of a hot topic for a while after the Across the Spider-Verse movie came out, and the majority of the reasoning that folks point to, which like I know that has been pointed out on Twitter and TikTok and all of that jazz, is that like she has a trans flag on the wall of her room, and at one point you can see that her dad has a trans pride patch on his jacket, and even during that one particularly important and emotive kind of monologue that she has, both Gwen and the world around her, which the creators of the Spider-Verse have said is like specifically inspired by mood rings and is emotionally responsive relevant to whatever's going on. All of the colours of everything start morphing into the colours of the trans flag, and this is all while she's basically, I was gonna say coming out, but you know, coming clean to her dad about the whole Spider-Woman situation and her identity as Spider-Woman. And you know, not only did all of that appear in an animated movie where, by definition, every piece of set dressing has to be drawn by hand and then carefully placed in the scene and undergo several stages of creative approval along the way, but especially in a movie like Spider-Verse, where you could scrub through every frame and, you know, it's plain to see the careful thought and intent that gets put into every single element that's in every single frame. In a movie like that, it feels practically impossible to chalk an entire trifecta of trans flags and imagery showing up only and specifically in one singular character's narrative up to coincidence. Coupled with the fact that her personal story arc in the movie also does just kind of read like a metaphor for the trans experience in general, um, I would certainly say it feels pretty reasonable to look at all of that and say, you know, I feel like Gwen might be trans, I feel like that might be the implication here. Um, <laughs> And, you know, obviously doing the math on all of that and coming to that conclusion doesn't actually change anything about the canon events of the movie itself. Like, at this point in time, it's more just like a really cool thing to see. Um, to see that the movie makers kind of factored that in for people who are able to pick up on that kind of coding to be able to pick up on. Um, I feel like that sentence got away from me a bit, but hopefully you get what I mean. Although that said, again, I highly doubt that the Spider-Verse team would put anything into those movies unintentionally at this point, or potentially to phrase that a little bit better, I don't feel like they would put anything into these movies that didn't have an eventual payoff planned, or that wasn't like a hint for something that would be revealed later in maybe the next sequel, for instance. So I know that when it comes to my interpretation of things, I'm definitely going to consider Gwen to be trans until proven otherwise. However, as is unfortunately often the case, um, at least online because that's where negative people tend to shout the loudest, whenever any character from anything is either read or reimagined or even just plainly implied within canon to be queer or POC or just anything other than the commonly assumed default of cis, het, and white basically, you can end up seeing some real ugly pushback to that from people with generally horrendous vibes. Um, <laughs> 
oftentimes in fact, um, and, and this is actually where my whole train of thought about like, well for me, Gwen is going to be trans until proven otherwise, came from. Oftentimes, unless a character verbally outs themselves to everyone they meet by specifically saying, hello, I am a trans person, verbatim, there will always be people who will insist that because they never said that they were queer out loud, that particular character could never be queer, no matter how much thematic or narrative implication there may be to the contrary. So when it comes to the Spider-Verse movies, needless to say I have seen a fair amount of those exact kind of disagreements around even just the suggestion that Gwen could be trans. And I know we're well past Pride Month by now, but that whole kind of topic has just really been stuck on my mind lately. Not only because when people refuse to acknowledge even the potential existence of a fictional trans person like that, it obviously comes from a place of real-world transphobia on their part, and that obviously sucks, but also because it's just really dumb. Um, <laughs> I mean, again, even putting aside the fact that everyone is assumed straight until proven queer is a really limiting perspective to take anyway, it's also quite literally the moral of these movies that anyone can wear the mask and be Spider-Man, or indeed Spider-Woman in this case. So for some people to take the position of like, yeah, anyone can be Spider-Man, except for trans people, is genuinely just incorrect. It's a one-sentence oxymoron, and it's maddening to see. You get what I'm saying? Like, it's silly. Much like every other instance of transphobia in the wider world, it's all just rooted in very silly, flimsy opinions. I think another big part of what, um, I guess what I find really annoying with the whole, uh, and this goes beyond just the Spider-Verse now, I'm talking about like any time you see people acting like there needs to be some kind of reason for a character to be trans or queer or that there isn't any real evidence, so to speak, um, to suggest them being trans and so on. Something about that, especially in rare instances like this where there's literally a, a trans flag with the words protect trans kids on it plastered onto the walls in the background, so you know, there's no debating what the meaning of that could possibly be. Um, it really just grates on me mostly as a former media study student because I really can't fathom why some people would be so dead set on like, I don't know, rejecting anybody else's interpretation because that essentially just cuts themselves off from getting to re-experience a really good story from a whole nother perspective. And for what? You know, like, evidently cutting themselves off from another interpretation and refusing to get to see the story in a new light doesn't gain them anything. Is it just because they'd rather suck? I don't... <laughs> I don't get it. And I think there is like an extra layer of both frustration and just sheer bafflement for me from that media studies kind of perspective, because, you know, that kind of naysaying doesn't do the people who wish to naysay any real favours, because all it really does at the end of the day is show, like, a complete lack of media literacy at a very basic level, which I would personally find a bit embarrassing, I don't know. Um, <laughs> because, you know, a lot of the time, again, in cinema in general, like, not just contained within this Spider-Verse example, um, but a lot of the time important things are not said out loud verbally, because most filmmakers know how to use nuance and subtext and visually imply things in their filmmaking and their storytelling so that they can subtly reveal information to the audience without having to, you know, have the characters say, oh hello, I am whatever I am, out loud. And if some of those more subtly implied things are communicated in, like, a visual language that you can't read because you're not personally familiar with, you know, that language or coding or iconography or whatever, that's okay. And I think that's what a lot of people who do reject any implication that Gwen could be trans, um, or again that any other character from any other media could be trans in general if we're looking at the bigger picture, I feel like that's the crux of what like people who reject other people's readings of characters like that fail to understand. It's a lot like needing subtitles to understand a foreign language film, right? Like, if you go in without the subtitles and you don't understand what's being said throughout the film, that doesn't mean that no words were said, it just means that you don't speak that language. So, of course you're not going to get it. And the same goes for visual language as well. If you're not familiar with the visual language of another community, it's only natural that certain things which do hold meaning to others would kind of just go over your head. But when other people do resonate with and see themselves reflected in what's being shown on screen, it doesn't matter if you didn't get that message, because it wasn't for you. And again, that's okay, everything can't be for everyone because everyone is different. But I think it's safe to say that the shitty thing to do in, in this whole equation is to either reject or outright deny the kind of reading or experience or interpretation of somebody else just because you didn't get something or you didn't connect with it in the same way that they did. Kind of like how, um, I don't know if you've seen those clips of, I think it's like cinemas in India where people got really really hyped up when Spider-Man 
Mumbai showed up and had his whole introduction to Mumbatan. Like, even if some things in that sequence are mainly going to resonate with folks who are of that community, like I'm sure there are things in that section that went over my head, even though I completely loved that bit, it was one of my favourite, like, parts of the film. The fact that folks resonated with it in the first place, who, you know, it was kind of intended to resonate with, is proof enough that there was something there that did specifically speak to them, you know what I mean? In my case, for example, um, you know, besides all of the other kind of trans-implied moments I mentioned already, because they really stuck with me too, but even just something as simple as, you know, seeing the trans flag that was hung up in Gwen's room, and there was no commentary on it, it wasn't referenced in any way, it was just there. Just seeing it there was enough to make me start crying in the cinema, instantly. Um, <laughs> And, you know, that's a little embarrassing to admit, but also it took me by surprise, because I'd already seen screenshots of that moment before going to the cinema, I knew it was going to be there in the background, and it didn't really seem like anything too major, because it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't even, you know, acknowledged in any way really. But still, even if it was only for the duration of one shot, the message that I got from that flag even being there in the first place was that a superhero believes that people like me are worth saving. And because a lot of very loud, very negative people in power these days in real life don't tend to hold the same opinion, it mattered. So you know, while it is true that Gwen never specifically said, my name's Gwen Stacy and I'm the one and only transgender spider woman, sometimes actions and narrative theming and set design and costume design, color language and many other such implications can speak far louder than words. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, I don't know, I feel like I've gone on a whole kind of very roundabout ramble here and maybe touched on some much bigger societal kind of topics than I normally would, so apologies if it got heavy there at all for a second, I just, you know, had a lot of thoughts on the topic kind of swirling around that I really wanted to get out. But um, I think really the main takeaway from all of this is that, you know, people can debate whether Gwen is canonically trans or not until the cows come home, if that's what they want to do, but one thing that's not up for debate is that she or any other character from any other thing absolutely absolutely could be, because there is no good reason why they shouldn't be. And also, secondary moral, secondary takeaway, if you will, is that transphobia is and always has been so, so stupid. Um, <laughs> but for now, thank you very much for joining me for this one, I hope you've had a good time, and until next time, I hope you'll keep on staying as safe, happy, and healthy as you possibly can.